is religion really the enemy of science? Is science the only reliable source of knowledge about the origins of the universe and human life? These are common questions, and so in this video I want to look at four models that explore the relationship between science and faith and show how each model offers a different answer to these important questions. So let's begin with the simple observation that there is an objective reality. Let's also begin with the claim that we can know something about that reality. But what role do science and theology play in leading us to that knowledge? Ian Barber's groundbreaking book, Religion in the Age of Science, offers us four approaches or models that illustrate how different people seek to answer that question. On the two extremes of the spectrum, we have the conflict model and the integration model. In between, we have the independence and dialogue models. So building on his work, let's do a quick survey of what each model offers. So let's begin with the conflict model. So the big idea here is that science and religion are said to explore the same reality using irreconcilable methodology, such that the in infallible knowledge of one must exclude the fallible knowledge of the other. So it doesn't matter whether you are a religious person and you think all knowledge begins with religious truth and that pushes aside or eliminates scientific knowledge, or if you are a scientifically minded person and you think the more we know about science, the less room that leads for God. Both of these approaches really share that conflict model that their methodology is the infallible source of truth and the other methodology is flawed and has no place given this inherent conflict. Michael Murray gives a pretty good analysis here of this potential conflict. He says, science consists of beliefs that are justified by sense experience and by the scientific method. Therefore, the only justifiable beliefs about the natural world are those that arise from sense experience and the scientific method. In contrast, he says that religion consists of beliefs that are drawn from purported divine revelations and that these beliefs are held entirely on the basis of authority. Therefore, the only justifiable beliefs about the natural world are those that are held on the basis of religious authority. So you can see here where this conflict lies. Let me give another quote that I find interesting. This comes from Sir Richard Gregory's epitaph in Nature Magazine. He said this, quote, My grandfather preached the gospel of Christ. My father preached the gospel of socialism. I preached the gospel of science. And here we see in this simple quote, in his epitaph, this idea that only science provides true knowledge. Science has shoved aside these old ways of knowing and replaced it with a new and more sure way of knowing. On the religious side, let's look at a guy, Cornelius Van Til, and his book, A Christian Theory of Knowledge. He says this, quote, In every discussion about every fact, therefore, it is the two principles, that of the believer in Scripture and that of the non-Christian, that stand over against one another. Both principles are totalitarian. Both claim all the facts. It is in this light of this point that the relation of the Bible as the infallible word of God to the facts of science and history must finally be understood. So for Van Til, he offers the exact opposite explanation of Sir Richard Gregory. For Van Til, only religion gives true knowledge. So what are the strengths and weaknesses of this conflict model? Well, I'm not a fan of this model, and I don't think there's a lot that I find redeeming about this approach, but I do think one of the strengths is that the conflict model recognizes, or pushes for at least, a unified reality. It tries to tell us that, hey, religion doesn't speak to one reality, and science speak to a separate reality. It says, look, there is one reality, and everything speaks to that one reality. I think the weaknesses, though, is that it creates an either scientific materialism or a theological presuppositionalism approach. You only get these two extremes as a possibility within this view. Education models, therefore, end up minimizing certain methods of knowing. So either you study theology or you study science or you study philosophy, and you get these very focused disciplines in our education, but people who aren't really aware of the study and information that, and the knowledge that comes inside these other disciplines. And ultimately, I think the worst part about this model is that it breeds division between people with different worldviews. Uh, it treats people with these different views as irreconcilable, and basically they, they are balkanized, they're segregated into different camps that can never be connected. The second approach we find is called the independence model. 
And the big idea here is that science and religion are said to explore distinct facets of reality using distinctive methodologies or by focusing on distinctive objects such that the truth of one must exclude the truth of the other. So in the independence model, both science and religion are said to have importance and value in understanding reality, but science, for example, tells us objective truths of how things happen. Religion only tells us uh, subjective or personal truths about the reality of why things happen. Stephen Jay Gould is probably the most well-known atheist thinker on this, proposing an independence model, and his is called NOMA, or Non-Overlapping Magisteria. For Gould, science sticks to objective empirical facts, and religion sticks to the subjective ethical values and spiritual meaning. In his work, he said this, quote, while the magisteria might discuss a common object or topic, cloning, for example, the methods and aims will be different. Science uses theory construction and experimentation to determine how cloning does or might work. Religion uses philosophical theorizing or appeals to authority to determine the moral boundaries in our use of cloning technology. So he says, hey, we're, we're, we're discussing a common reality, but really they speak to two different things that don't have any real connection. On the religious side, we have Old Testament scholar John Walton, and he applies this independence model to his interpretation of Genesis and to his advocacy for things like uh, theistic evolution. He says this, quote, the most important result of this study is the realization that the Genesis account pertains to functional origins rather than material origins, and that temple ideology underlies the Genesis cosmology. So again, there's a distinction between the material and the immaterial, and Genesis, the, the spiritual side, only speaks to those immaterial or ethical reasoning, but they don't speak to the material or the objective observations we find in science. Now, I think these quotes illustrate two flawed foundations for the independence model. First, this sort of underlying or unstated assumption that science makes no philosophical or moral claims, and the other assumption being that religion makes no empirical or observable or objective claims. I think both of those are false assumptions. However, what are the strengths and weaknesses of this independence model? Well, the first strength, I think, is that this model accepts that both science and religion offer true knowledge. Uh, I think that's important to recognize that both are a valid way of knowing. Second, in its own way, it eliminates the conflict between these methods of knowing. Now, I, I think that also sort of brings up the weaknesses of this independence model. It also eliminates the possibility of enriching dialogue. So there, there's no conflict, but there's also no possibility of dialogue either. So it's what well, it gives with one hand, it sort of takes with the other. The second weakness here is that God is restricted to the religious facet of life. And this creates a huge divide in terms of practical faith, living it out in the world around us. For example, if this model holds true, there's no objective theology for environmental care. There's no objective ethic to guide human interaction because all theology remains the province of personal view or religious uh, subjective opinion. The third model we can look at is called the dialogue model. Now, the big idea here is that science and religion are said to cover overlapping domains, sharing common ground and some basic presuppositions, methods, and concepts. Now, this doesn't mean certainly that they share everything in common, but it does allow for some area of overlap that these two disciplines can speak to the one reality. Going back to the early 1800s, I, I think there are some religious scholars who certainly held this view. In a letter from a gentleman named Mr. Butterworth to Adam Clark, who was a Wesleyan theologian, he says this, I conceive that the generality of our commentators are divines only and have but little knowledge of natural philosophy and science in general, which greatly serves in the illustration of the sacred text. So his point is, that, hey, our theologians and our commentators don't really have a great understanding of science, which is helpful. If they had this knowledge, they could better illustrate and understand the meaning of the text. 
John Pokinghorn is a physicist and theologian who writes this, quote, Worship and prayer is the context in which theology has to be practiced. The academic departments of religious studies in our universities are like schools of science unfurnished with laboratories. So I love the imagery he creates here is this idea that science and religion are not as far apart as we think and they need to be in dialogue. So what are the strengths and weaknesses we find here? Well, first, strengths, it accepts a unity of reality, as we saw in some of the other models. Uh, it accepts that both science and religion offer independent methods of knowing, which is good. So they're not completely one kind of not way of knowing. Third, it assumes the contingency in intelligibility of the natural order. That is to say that uh, the laws of nature and initial conditions are not necessary conditions, but we can know and understand this reality through both science and theology. And fourth, I think the strength here is that it's open to both scientific and religious answers to empirical observations. The weaknesses. Well, I don't list a lot here, but it's not because I don't think there are any. It's just that uh, there's there's a breadth of theories really within this model. There's a there's a large spectrum that I can't go over in this short introductory video that are worth exploring. And so there's a lot of weaknesses potentially in individuals who are proposing these types of dialogue models, but uh, I just can't cover them all here. So those are something you'll have to explore a little bit on your own. Finally, we have the integration model. And the big idea here is that science and religion are said to cover the same domain, such that when united, they form an all-inclusive, albeit historically contingent, portrait of reality. Science shapes theology, just as theology shapes science. So again, here, what we have is that Religion and science, they come together inside this one reality and they give us a whole new perspective together and both are sort of evolving and shaping one another as time goes on and as new discoveries occur. Now, Barber outlines three theological models that offer this sort of integrative approach. He looks at natural theology, which he says searches for understanding of God through observations of nature, people like Richard Swinburne. Uh, he says there's a theology of nature approach that begins with a religious framework for enriching one's study of nature, people like Alistair McGrath. Uh, and then there's process philosophy or constructive postmodernism, which sees no belief as final, but an ongoing process of experience that shapes reality. And folks like Alfred North Whitehead would fall into this category. Now, this is the model that Barber himself gravitated towards, and he says it this way, quote, in a theology of nature, the main sources of theology lie outside of science, but scientific theories may affect the reformulation of certain doctrines, particularly the doctrines of creation and human nature. In a systematic synthesis, both science and religion contribute to the development of an inclusive metaphysics, such as that of process philosophy. So again here, he's saying that the way this works together is that science gives us a more sure knowledge of human origins, and this gives us the framework to reshape our theology. But he would also argue there are places where our theology can equally shape our science. One final quote from Barber, I think, helps us understand this integration model. He writes, quote, In articulating a theology of nature, a systematic metaphysics can help us toward a coherent vision. But Christianity should never be equated with any metaphysical system. There are dangers if either scientific or religious ideas are distorted to fit a preconceived synthesis that claims to encompass all reality. The importance of this quote for Barber is that he's trying to allow for the independent value of theology and the independent value, really, of, of science and trying to shoehorn these things into one large meta-narrative or giant metaphysic of reality is difficult in his view. So what then are the strengths and weaknesses of the integration model? Well, first, I think it, it again accepts the unity of a reality. It assumes the contingency and intelligibility of the natural order, and it's open to both scientific and religious answers to empirical observations. So very similar in that sense to the dialogic model we saw earlier. 
whoever the weakness I see here is that for this model to succeed, both science and revelation have to be conceived of as two equal forms of revelation, that both have equal authority to speak to reality. Consequently, all knowledge, both scientific and theological, is historically contingent knowledge. Again, like, like we said before, that means that theology and science are really dependent on the time and culture and place in which they developed. So there is no absolute or authoritative theological or scientific understanding of that one reality. Both are working to understand that reality, but neither one has ultimate authority. And third, I think the weakness here is that uh, this model allows science to reshape theology and doctrine uh, and theology to shape science. Uh, it's what Barber sees as a strength, but I think ultimately it uh, doesn't make a distinction between theology, which are systems that Christians have created for knowing, and biblical doctrine, which uh, supersede in authority uh, any theological system. And without making that distinction, I think it makes everything a evolution of ideas. So back to the original questions. Is religion the enemy of science? Is science the only reliable source of knowledge about the origins of the universe and human life? I hope this video helps you see why the answer to these questions doesn't have to be no. Science and religion are not at war, and science is not the only path to knowledge about our world.